are coming on the air with that breaking news tonight. Sources telling us that Chris Christie is expected to announce that he is suspending his campaign for president. This is the event. This is a live look right now at New Hampshire. Our reporter is live on the scene. We're going to get to that ASAP here in the show. We've also got the frantic search tonight out west for anybody who may have been caught in an avalanche at a popular Tahoe ski resort. Just some of the fallout from those massive and deadly storms slamming the U.S. We're live with what's next for the hundreds of thousands of people without power and the forecast for the millions still at risk of even more bad weather than a stunner in Washington as Hunter Biden surprises everybody by showing up in front of a Republican committee trying to discipline him for not showing up in front of a Republican committee. Why the GOP is so furious on the politics front and what's next for the president's son tomorrow on the legal front. Plus, new reporting tonight, first into NBC News, about a new lawsuit facing Starbucks. Is their coffee really as ethically sourced as they say? And an entire country under lockdown tonight after a prison break by one of Ecuador's most notorious drug lords. Why things there are spiraling in a story we've been on top of since it broke. Then a new twist in the Aaron Rodgers saga. He will be off your screens or at least off ESPN for the rest of the NFL season. We'll explain why coming up later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. We're going to get to our top story in just a minute, but we got to get to that breaking news now. We are learning in the last few minutes that Chris Christie, according to multiple sources, is set to suspend his presidential campaign. You are looking at a live shot there of a stage in Wyndham, New Hampshire. This is event, an event for him, his event, I should say, where he is expected to come out and make that announcement. Obviously, this is happening just days before the Iowa caucuses and a little under two weeks before, of course, the New Hampshire primary. We've got a lot on this here. Shaq Brewster following this for us live in New Hampshire. Ali Vitale is live for us in Iowa. Shaq, I will start with you. Talk us through what we know right now. Where is the former New Jersey governor and what's he going to say? Well, Holly, we can expect to see the former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie appear on that stage in the building behind me any minute now. And as you mentioned, two sources who are familiar with plans and campaign uh, conversations are expecting him to announce that he will be suspending his presidential campaign. Now, Holly, we know and we have seen Chris Christie's campaign since it was launched in June. We've seen it be uh, somewhat of a struggling campaign. He announced and he said and he acknowledged that he had a long shot campaign and that this was a long shot candidacy. But in his words and in his rationale, all of the contenders in the field not named Donald Trump are long shots in this race. The difference that he has been trying to make is that he was the candidate that was willing to take on Donald Trump forcefully and aggressively. His campaign slogan throughout was that truth matters. And he said that he was the one who was willing to tell the truth against Donald Trump. Hallie, as recently as yesterday, Chris Christie pushed back on the pressure that we've been hearing in Republicans in circles around his candidacy, candidacy from donors, from uh, Republican leaders, suggesting that it was time for him to drop out, suggesting that perhaps if he drops out in a state like New Hampshire, where he's been polling, there were recent polls uh, showing him with 12 percent in polls here in the state, that if he drops out, much of that support could go to Nikki Haley and help her candidacy. He has pushed back on many of those conversations, on many of those suggestions. But according to those two campaign officials, Hallie, it's or campaign uh, people, according to those two sources familiar with the campaign's planning, it seems as if in the next couple of minutes, Hallie, he will be suspending his campaign after significant resistance. Shaq, I'm going to ask you to stand by for just a second as I bring in Ali Vitale here, who is covering the landscape from a different state, a no less critical state, of course, and that is Iowa. And listen, as I've been talking to sources about this all afternoon, as I know you have too. There's been a lot of discussion about the state of play now in New Hampshire, if Chris Christie yeah. does what we think he's going to do. But there could also be an impact on Iowa, where we know the race for second place is extremely close. Chris Christie has done almost nothing in Iowa, right? That's not the area where he's campaigning. He's focused on New Hampshire, but yeah. he's still polling at a couple, getting a couple of percentage points in polls, and a couple of percentage points could make the difference between second and third place where you are. That's true. It could make a difference. But I think the real dynamic shift here comes on the ground in New Hampshire. And it has the opportunity to be beneficial to Nikki Haley almost more than it does anybody else not named Trump in this field. I have to tell you that as we were trying to track down these rumors today, Hallie, by calling up our sources, the ones who I spoke to who are fans of Nikki Haley only heard Christie dropping out, or rather the potential for it at that point, as would be good news for them. Because you look at the polling that we here at NBC have done, the fact 
that Nikki Haley is seen by Christie supporters as someone that they would likely move to next if Christie were no longer an option. It really does sort of amplify the space that Haley is in, especially as we're looking at polls that show her within striking distance of the former president. And frankly, those polls are closer than we've seen most polls get. She's the person who's been able to get at least within single digit numbers of Donald Trump in places like New Hampshire. When you think about Chris Christie, though, and the reason potentially why he's not endorsing here, but is heeding the pressure that he got from folks that Shaq and I were talking about from people who were saying, hey, don't you want someone not named Trump to be the nominee? Get out of the race and give Nikki Haley or someone else a clearer path in, in a place like New Hampshire. Clearly, Christie heard those calls, but I can, I can say this to you guys because we all did the 15 and 16 race together. I remember when Chris Christie was trying to get Nikki Haley to support him when he was still a president presidential contender before he folded and endorsed Donald Trump in a move that really shocked all of us. I wonder now, and we'll get into this as we still talk to our sources after this news unravels, if that's part of a reason why we're seeing him not endorse Haley, but instead just leave the race. I mean, there's so many questions about how and why this is happening now, but the only thing that's for sure is that this really does have a clear impact on what we're set for in New Hampshire a week from now. Yeah, no kidding. Ali and Shaq, I know you're both going to stay close to a camera. Ali, if you can get somewhere indoors in, in the warmth, that's a good thing, too, yes. because we are going to wait to see, of course, <laughs> former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. Again, you're looking at live at the left-hand side of your screen. That is Wyndham, New Hampshire. Shaq is there, too. And that is where we expect to see Governor Christie come out and make that announcement, which, as Ali and Shaq have just laid out, could shake up this race, at least the race for second place in some of these key early states. So we're going to have more on that later in the show, as well as some additional analysis and reports. Reporting Ali and Shaq, thank you. Stick around for that. We're going to see what Chris Christie says. While he is not, as one source says, expected to endorse anybody, we're going to find out soon. we got to get to the other big story that we're following tonight. And we are getting some new developments on that in just the last couple of minutes. The deadly aftermath of a storm that has killed at least five people. It has contributed, apparently, to an avalanche at a popular Tahoe ski resort. And in the last five minutes, we've learned that avalanche was deadly. One person killed, according to officials, one person hurt. We're going to get an update on that later on this hour with the mountain now shut down for the day. Again, this is at Tahoe, at Lake Tahoe. It's called the Palisades Ski Resort, essentially. The governor of California is monitoring that with all of it coming after that monster series of storms with most of the country still under winter alerts. Out east, a lot of concern about flooding with New England seeing torrential rain. A mandatory evacuation has been ordered along a river in Connecticut because a dam partially collapsed there. Look at that. You can see what happened. Emergency responders on the ground are responding to it, of course. They're sending folks to shelter at a school nearby because they say this is so hazardous right now. Travel-wise, we're seeing more than 500 delays across the country, which is the domino effect of those ground stops at big airports overnight. And keep in mind, this storm is just the opening act for what's to come over the next week. A potential bomb cyclone blizzard for the Midwest, an Arctic blast, courtesy of the polar vortex, and maybe the first real East Coast snowstorm in years. Meteorologist Bill Perrins is joining us now. So, Bill, let me start on some of this new information that we are getting on this avalanche. According to, I understand, the sheriff's office here, the debris field, something like 150 feet wide, 450 feet long. Talk us through it and what has happened here. All right, so this is Palisades Tahoe. We showed you the graphic of it. Here's Lake Tahoe here, and it's located right about here. It's been snowing hard all day today. The winds have been very strong. What's surprising about this is that there's not been a lot of snow uh, in many areas of the West, and especially at Palisades Tahoe. I was just looking. They've only had about 50 inches of snow up until New Year, and then they had a 9-inch snowfall, which was the biggest to date. And then three days ago, they had 17 inches of snow. So so what likely happened is they had that nine inch layer and that kind of hardened and then they get a 17 inch layer on top of it and they don't kind of combine they kind of sit on top of each other and if the weather conditions are just right that top layer can slide and so this was in an area that hasn't been skied yet this winter season they just opened up today what's called kt 22 lift and that lift went to the top this was at 9 30 in the morning so the first runs the first round of skiers went on this area that hasn't been skied called the gully and that's when it gave away at the top and then it crescended down the mountain and gaining snow and momentum with it. And so that's what, you know, an eyewitness account on the chairlift saw, Hallie. So uh, very scary, surprising, because they haven't had a lot of snow. It just shows you it doesn't take that much. All it takes is the beginning of an avalanche, and then it just snowballs down the hill. So, uh, you yeah, uh, we'll get more information to you as we get it.
Yeah, and like I said, I want to make sure people understand this. We are expecting to get an update from officials. We thought it was going to be a couple minutes ago. It looks like that has been delayed. It's going to happen this hour. We're going to tell you everything that we're hearing about this as soon as we hear it. But, Bill, obviously, the storms that we've been talking about over the course of the last 48 hours dumped a bunch of snow on the Sierra Nevadas, right? And it yep. is just the start of what could be a pretty nasty one-two punch here for a lot of people in the country. Yeah, the 17 inches was from that storm that in Tahoe was the one that just exited the East Coast. Now they're dealing with the storm that's about to head through the middle of the country. So let me give you a wider view. And here's where the storm's located over Idaho. This is where we're in Reno. This is the Lake Tahoe area here where you see the blue is the snow at the high elevations. And this is all kicking into the middle of the country. This is almost going to be like a repeat of the last storm we saw. We've got about 11 million people under winter weather advisories. By the way, the Lake Tahoe area is under a winter storm warning currently. And as far as snow goes, we're expecting at least another foot in the uh, Reno, Lake Tahoe, Sierra area, the higher elevations. And all through the west, we're going to see a decent amount of snow, probably the highest totals that we've seen. Some areas of Colorado will get a couple feet of powder from this storm. So that's great for all the skiing, but then it increases the avalanche through, uh, to the forecast. And then, Hallie, we'll talk about a blizzard. Even in areas like Chicago could get a foot of snow. And then behind it, and as we've been mentioning, Iowa could have the coldest caucus day they've ever had. Bill Karens, you got a lot going on there. Appreciate it. And like I said, we're going to stay on top of that developing news this hour as we get it. Thank you, Bill. Stay close to a camera. It's a day of a lot of news for sure, because not too long ago, the House Judiciary Committee voted along party lines to recommend that the House of Representatives vote to hold Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress for defying a subpoena. And that is after a kind of bananas day at the Capitol. Look at this. Hunter Biden, there he is, the president's son. He's the one in the darker tie on the right, in the middle of your screen. He shows up, unexpected, unannounced, surprise, to another committee, House Oversight, for their contempt hearing. He's like, hey, I'm here. I'll talk, right? He was escorted by Secret Service, flanked by his lawyers. That committee is also expected to vote on this potential contempt issue tonight. But this was such a scene here. You see Hunter Biden sitting in the front row, basically where members of the public would be able to sit. And that's apparently how he showed up today, just as like another... American, another member of the public showing up here. There is a political dynamic involved here. We're going to get to that in a second. But before we do, you got to look at some of this back and forth here about whether to allow him to be heard. One Republican lawmaker actually said he should be arrested on the spot. Listen. You are the epitome of white privilege coming into the Oversight Committee, spitting in our face, ignoring a congressional subpoena to be deposed. What are you afraid of? You have no balls to come up here and... M Mr. Chairman, point of inquiry. Mr. Chairman... Um, if the, the lady recognized the general, if the general lady wants to hear from Hunter Biden, we can hear from him right now, Mr. Chairman. Let's take a vote and hear from I'm Hunter speaking. Biden. What are, are you afraid of? To speak? Hold on, afraid hold on, hold on. Why, order, why order. Guys, Hunter Biden should be arrested right here, right now, and go straight to jail. Uh, drama, Sal Hukapur, who is joining us now. I mean, this was, again, such a scene, such a moment here. And there was a reason for it, too, right, as we're getting ready for the House Oversight Committee, potentially to vote on contempt later tonight, because Hunter Biden, it seems, wanted to make a statement here to members of Congress. And what unfolded was obviously, you know, n newsworthy, uh, if chaotic and messy. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. After Hunter Biden's surprise appearance and all the theatrics that followed, the House Judiciary Committee voted 23 to 14 on purely partisan lines to advance that contempt resolution, holding Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress for defying a subpoena. The House Oversight Committee has yet to vote on it. They're still plugging away at that process. And then after that happens, it'll go to the full House of Representatives, which will need a majority vote to formally approve that contempt of Congress citation. If so, it'll be referred to the Justice Department, specifically a U.S. attorney in Washington, who would then have the decision to make whether to criminally charge Hunter Biden, the son of President Joe Biden, for contempt of Congress. That would uh, come with uh, potentially a fine and jail time. As we saw in the January 6th committee, sometimes the U.S. Attorney's Office prosecutes these cases with contempt of Congress, but other times it doesn't. And at the end of the day, it'll be the Justice Department, not Congress, that has the last word here. What did Hunter Biden have to say about all this here? Because he walked through the halls of Congress. His attorney made a statement and spoke. He's with, by the way, uh, a, a figure that some people may not be familiar with, uh, essentially a, a friend who's been working with him through this whole process, helping to pay some of his bills. We understand in the purple jacket there, you see. Talk us through some of that dynamic, because I know our Ryan Nobles, our colleague, also caught up with him just very briefly. 
That's right. Hunter Biden himself had little to say. His lawyers had a lot more to say about this. Essentially, their message was that he is willing to testify. The reason he showed up, uh, you know, to that to that hearing unannounced is that he wants to try to convey that he's not hiding from Republicans, that he's not trying to hide from this investigation. They just insist that he's only going to testify publicly, not behind closed doors, as Republicans have demanded. Uh, Hunter Biden's attorney, Abby Lowell, said Republicans are operating on a, a bad faith political motive here, basically arguing that they will distort, manipulate, and misuse his testimony if it's done privately and not in the light of day for everyone to see the full context of what he's saying. And yes, our colleague Ryan Nobles briefly did catch up with Hunter Biden on the question of whether he would be willing to testify immediately today uh, when, if, in, in the event that he was asked. Let's play what Hunter said. If they called you to testify today, would you say yes? That was a yes from Hunter Biden as to whether he would testify today. Of course, he was not asked to testify today, and Republicans proceeded to vote uh, on that contempt citation. Hallie. Sahil Kapoor, live for us on Capitol Hill. Thank you so much. Also in Washington, the Transportation Secretary saying tonight that Boeing understands the gravity of the situation that's come out of that Alaska Airlines incident we've been talking about for nearly a week now. Of course, that hole blown into the side of a plane in midair. Here's Pete Buttigieg, Secretary Buttigieg, just a couple of hours ago, talking with our Tom Costello. Listen to this. Every plane that they deliver to an airline, every plane that goes into the skies needs to be 100% safe. And they need to be able to demonstrate that, which means finding and fixing anything related to this issue, whether it's directly or indirectly related. It's because of those concerns that you've now got United and Alaska Airlines canceling more Boeing 737 MAX 9 flights today. Remember, the MAX 9 is the model of this plane that saw that door plug essentially ripped out of it while people were on the plane in the air last week. In a new statement, Alaska now says you should expect to see more cancellations at least through this weekend, at least through Saturday. It's waiting for some of these inspection procedures. It's got to go through, check all of its other MAX 9s. They fly MAX 9s. United flies MAX 9s. So the reason why all this is happening, well, Boeing's CEO says it is because of a, I want to quote here, this is a direct quote, a quality escape. Let me press pause on that, and I want you to play what he said to CNBC. Listen. Whatever information we get or glean, we will, we will look everywhere, around the MAX, around the spirit factories, our own factories, our inspection processes, and we'll make sure that we take steps to ensure that it never, never can happen again. Tom Costello is joining us now. Okay, so Tom, there have been a lot of pieces of news coming out on this today. Notably, of course, what we're hearing from the head of Boeing and notably what we're hearing from the guy who's in charge of the transportation apparatus in this country, and yeah. that is Secretary Buttigieg. Walk us through some of the highlights here and then secondarily, more on the sort of quality escape piece of things that Boeing's talking about. Okay, so the bottom line here is that, as you mentioned, both Alaska and United still have their fleets grounded. About 146 planes, more or less, I think it is. No flights, no MAX 9 flights are flying because they still haven't started the inspection process of those MAX 9s. And the reason is because the FAA and Boeing are still trying to work out the precision, the engineering precision, with which they do the inspections and then whatever fix would be required. And this is important now. The bottom line is the fuselage for the MAX 9 is made by a company called Spirit Aerosystems out of Wichita, Kansas. They essentially produce the tube. They give the tube to Boeing. Boeing produces the plane. They fix it out. They put the electronics in it, the seats, everything else. So the question is, well, if there was a, some sort of a quality control breakdown, or he said quality escape, the, where did it happen? Well, you heard from CEO David Calhoun. It's not clear if it happened either with Spirit Aerosystems in Wichita, with, which produced the tube, or at Boeing. And listen, Boeing has the last hands on that piece, right? Because Spirit gives them this big, empty tube, and then Boeing has to fit it all out. So the question is, where was the breakdown? How did this defect apart? And it now appears that Boeing is admitting that there was a quality problem, a serious quality problem. Where did it happen, at Boeing or at Spirit? Didn't happen at Alaska Airlines, right? They just, it was a brand new plane, and they started flying it, as they should. They don't rip apart the walls, checking the bolts. So that's the issue right now. Spirit Aerosystems did, by the way, give us a statement, and essentially they said they continue to cooperate with the NTSB, with the FAA, and they are supporting that investigation uh, throughout. That's what you would expect. They are a party to the investigation, along with Boeing, of course, Alaska Airlines as well. 
Tom Costello, thank you so much. Uh, it is great to see you, as you have been doing all along here, reporting this out and continuing to do so. Let's talk about a different cabinet member now. The Secretary of State, who oversees, is in key meetings with the Palestinian leader in the West Bank as part of his high-stakes trip to that region that we've been talking about, all as the U.S. pushes Israel to try to scale back this war, to try to take some kind of more targeted approach and to embrace some kind of a plan for Gaza once this war ends. That brings us to tonight's original now, an in-depth look at a story we've been watching. NBC's Keir Simmons talking about what it could take to get Israel to stop the fight. Tens of thousands have been killed, say the United Nations and Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry, among them thousands of women and children. <laughs> And thousands of Hamas fighters are dead too, say the Israelis. Yet one man is still alive, according to Hamas, its leader, Yahya Sinwar. While if Israel had located him, it would likely say so. Israel's failure to find Sinwar and many others in the Hamas high command is one reason its pledge to dismantle Hamas is far from fulfilled, meaning peace may be a long way off. We traveled to Beirut, Lebanon to where last week the Hamas second-in-command died in a drone strike. Israel has not admitted it was behind the hit, but finding Salah al-Aruri, who had links to Iran, would have required a sophisticated spying operation. This local store owner, who says an air conditioner from the apartment smashed through his window, was amazed Hamas was there. You never saw anyone living there? La, 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 la. Not one time, he says. There, the hole in the roof where the munitions broke through before exploding, sending shrapnel hurtling across the street. This tree set on fire. This car incinerated. A textbook targeted assassination that risked killing many civilians. Israel has a long, controversial history of targeting its enemies back to the 1950s. Its attempt to kill Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat in Lebanon and beyond were called Operation Saltfish. And after 11 Israeli athletes were killed at the Munich Olympics, it methodically tracked down the terrorists involved with deadly results. But Israel has also often slipped up. In 2010, the assassination of a Hamas leader in Dubai caused international uproar when the killers, in disguise, were caught on hotel cameras. Now the heads of Israel's intelligence and security agencies, Mossad and Shin Bet, are vowing to hunt down all those behind the massacre of October 7th, where 1,200 people died and some 240 were taken hostage. A person familiar with the Israeli government's thinking tells NBC News Qatar and Turkey have unofficial immunity from strikes against Hamas leaders there. Foreign diplomats and former U.S. officials agree. With Hamas still holding hostages, Israel would be reluctant to undermine a communication channel through Qatar. We traveled to the capital of Qatar, Doha, to talk to a member of Hamas's political wing. Bassem Naim says many of his family in Gaza have been killed, seemingly in targeted strikes. Any leadership, he, will, he, he is expecting at some time to be targeted. Including you? Including me. He claims that efforts to keep the Hamas leader and mastermind of October 7th alive is just like the U.S. protecting its presidents. I am sure the security uh, instructions for someone like Joe Biden is not the security instructions for you in any case. Is Yahya Sinwar still in Gaza? This is the last information I have. Israel's hunt for the Hamas high command is pivotal. The country has accused Hamas of using civilians as human shields, as has the United Nations. And those who study Hamas say it may hold on to some hostages simply to protect its leaders. Hamas itself says it will not hand over all the hostages without a ceasefire. Israel, caught between a deepening humanitarian crisis in Gaza with an escalating civilian death toll and the fear among some that to stop fighting while the Hamas leadership is still in place will look like a defeat. Let's bring in Kier now. And Kier, uh, just as is, is always, strong reporting here. It's not just the idea of what's happening in Gaza, right, or what would happen next in Gaza. There's also the situation, as you and I have been talking about, what's happening elsewhere in the region, right? 
That's right, Hallie. And the spotlight uh, may well, in the days ahead, shift very dramatically to the Red Sea, to those Houthis in Yemen. We now hear that they have sent 21 air base, air and, and sea drones that were shot down by aircraft based uh, uh, aircraft. But <laughs> the, the fact that this is the largest attack so far after Secretary Blinken warned that there will be consequences. Uh, that is the big issue in, in the Red Sea uh, now. I, I understand before this that there was an idea to have six, a coalition of six countries ready to attack Houthi bases inside Yemen. I'm also told, though, by people who know Yemen well, that considering that the Saudi Arabia fought the Houthis for almost eight years and didn't silence them, there are real questions about whether that will work. So, going back to the piece, for Israel, they are looking at a real escalation in the region while they continue to try to pursue this war in Gaza despite the civilian casualties and they haven't managed to achieve their war aims and they are increasingly criticised around the world for what is happening in Gaza. In other words, Israel is trying to escape from effectively a lose-lose situation and it's difficult to see right now how Israel does escape that, honey. Kier Simmons, thank you so much for that. We're glad to have you bring us our original tonight. Appreciate it. Coming up, we've got a lot more to get to here on this show, a show that has turned into a lot of breaking news. As you can see, Chris Christie on stage as we speak. This is a live look at Wyndham, New Hampshire, an event where, according to multiple sources, he is expected to announce he is suspending his campaign. He hasn't said it yet. Those words have not come out of his mouth. We've got a team covering this, of course, from both New Hampshire to Iowa and across the country. We're going to dip back into this in just a second. Plus, we've also got a new thing at this big electronic show that's basically a mouse for your mouth. How it means you could get your touchscreen to work hands-free. And Starbucks getting sued over where it allegedly sources its coffee from. That's next. All right, let's get you back to that breaking news we covered at the top of the show. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, apparently, according to multiple sources, set to drop out of the presidential race or suspend his campaign at least literally any minute. This is him live right now in Wyndham, New Hampshire, at an event. He hasn't actually said those words just yet, but prior to the event beginning, there was apparently a hot mic moment in which he was perhaps caught talking about some of his competitors who remain in the race. Let me get to Shaq Brewster. And Shaq, as we are now waiting to see what exactly Chris Christie is going to say, tell us about this moment where it seemed like maybe he was talking about Nikki Haley. This is reverberating throughout the political world already. Talk us through it. Right, Hallie, potentially talking about Nikki Haley and also mentioning Ron DeSantis by name. Let's again clarify that we did not see Chris Christie during these comments. This was from his campaign live stream, and you heard some of his audio. And in some of the conversations, we don't know who these conversations were with. You talk about him talking about the money that she, talking about another candidate, not naming Haley, but presumably Haley, spent in other states, and the money that he spent in this campaign, and talked about how close they are and how. Uh, she hasn't been doing as well, in his opinion, um, as he has been able to do getting that bang for the buck. You also heard him mention Ron DeSantis saying that he called him, that DeSantis called Christie petrified. That was a word that Governor Chris Christie used. Now, we are out to the campaign to get clarification, to get exactly a better understanding of what he was talking about and specifically who he was talking about. But remember, these comments are happening backstage at an event in which we were told uh, by people who are familiar with his campaign plans that he is planning to suspend his campaign. And you mentioned he's on stage right now inside the building behind me. What have we heard from him so far? Well, he first thanked people for coming up. He talked a little bit about the weather, and he is reading from a script right now, talking about how in 2016 he made the decision to back Donald Trump, to drop out of the race after losing New Hampshire. It was a state that he back then also invested heavily in, and how back then he decided to surprisingly ba uh, back Donald Trump. And he said that in that ins instance, he chose ambition over policy, ambition over what was right. And he said he promised himself and he promised his wife to never do that again. And he's going on talking about uh, admirable people, people who he admires in politics, saying that you can have ambition, but there's a way to do it. It seems as if, based on what we've been told from uh, people close to the campaign, based on what we're expecting from this, that that 
announcement is coming. We just have not heard it yet, but we can say that we did hear a little bit from him, at least hitting the other candidates uh, in this race uh, in that hot mic moment right before he took the stage, Hallie. Yeah, that is for sure. Shaq Brewster, we're going to be following every minute of this, of course, waiting for that news that we expect to hear from Chris Christie with some obvious implications here for the other candidates in the race. Shaq, thanks. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the number of anti-Semitic incidents in this country have more than tripled since the October 7th Hamas attack in Israel, according to new data from the Anti-Defamation League. That's compared to the same time period back in 2022, according to ADL. There was an average, they say, of nearly 24 anti-Semitic incidents every single day after that attack, with most of them happening on college campuses or at Jewish institutions like synagogues. Number two, TSA says it found a record number of guns at checkpoints last year. The agency says 93%, nearly all of those 7,000 guns, were loaded. It's the third year in a row that we've seen record numbers as far as guns confiscated by airport security. Number three, the demand for mortgages is going up almost 10% last week as compared to the week before, even though mortgage rates themselves went up a little bit too. Still, they're definitely down from their peak a few months ago, which may be what's driving some of this. Number four, Ralph Yarl just earned his spot in the All-State Band. Remember, he was the black Missouri teenager who was shot in the head last year after accidentally ringing the wrong doorbell. He plays the bass clarinet. He's one of four students in his area to earn that spot. Number five, a new device will let you control technology with your tongue. If you ever wanted to do that, okay. It's called mouth pad. It goes in the roof, it goes in the roof of your mouth. It'll let you scroll, type, or even play chess with just the swipe of your tongue. The company, Augmental, says it was created to help people living with disabilities, which is incredible, of course. It's going to be available to the public later this year. Tonight, let's take you to uh, another part of the world here. Fear in Ecuador. You've got soldiers walking the streets. Schools and stores shut down. A lot of people home now with the country reeling from violence. The country essentially in lockdown. This is a story we've been telling you about all week, ever since that cartel leader escaped from prison. Then there was that attack at a TV station during a live broadcast. We brought you as breaking news last night on the show. Remember dynamite in the pocket of one of the anchors? All of this, again, triggered by this, what the Ecuadorian president calls an internal armed conflict with drug trafficking gangs. Thing is, Ecuador is just one piece of a bigger web in which drugs are sent to the United States, fueling, of course, addiction here. So you've got the U.S. government talking about this today, too. Our Guad Venegas has a closer look. Ecuador is under lockdown tonight as government forces clash with drug cartels across the country. A powder keg of violence exploding after one of the nation's most notorious cartel leaders was found missing in his prison cell over the weekend. Then the incident that shocked the world. Masked gunmen interrupting a live TV broadcast holding journalists hostage. Police stormed the station arresting the gunmen and all hostages were released. But Ecuador's new president still vowing to restore calm in the streets. Violent deaths rising in Ecuador, more than 8,000 last year. Its government says making it one of the most dangerous countries in Latin America. Behind Ecuador's troubles, something experts call narco-terrorism. Drug trafficking groups want to expand the production of narcotics to make a profit. At some point, they come in conflict with the state, and then they resort to terrorist tactics. And what happens in Ecuador doesn't necessarily stay there. It's sandwiched between what the U.N. says are the world's largest cultivators of cocaine, Colombia and Peru. The latter just declaring a state of emergency on its northern border with Ecuador. Very small country plays a very big role in the supply chain economics for multi-ton quantities of cocaine that transit through Ecuador to Mexico and then to the United States. The U.S. closely watching what's happening. Certainly, uh, we were willing to talk with the government of Ecuador about what they might need. Ecuador's president reconsidering the country's ban on extraditions of internationally wanted criminals and seizing assets from suspects. But experts say it could take a whole lot more than that. An all-out military effort to neutralize not just the cartel members, but all the individuals who support the cartel, the bankers, the lawyers, the individuals who help them launder their money. For now, Ecuador just trying to stabilize the situation as the country is up in flames. Our thanks to Guad Venegas for that reporting. We've got breaking news now back in New Hampshire where Chris Christie has officially suspended his campaign. Let's listen in for just a second here. 
as he is telling the crowd around him that that is the case. You see the gov former governor of New Jersey on stage now. Let's listen. So we have to decide now. We have to decide in the next 10 months who do we want to be as a country. We forget that people are walking thousands of miles still to get here. We talk about the problems in the border, and there are problems, and we have to fix them. And we have to secure our border, and we have to do it in a way that's smart and sensible and will work. Because it's not right to have a porous southern border in this country. But I want you to remember something. Those people who are coming over that border, many of them are walking hundreds, if not thousands of miles to get there. Because here is where they see hope. Here is where they see freedom. Here is where they see success. Here is where they see that flag, which means for them, thousands of miles away in other countries, all of those principles. We are still the indispensable nation for the rest of the world. We need to be the indispensable nation once again to each other. We need to believe in America as much as they believe in America. Right now, they believe in America in a way that this country, angry, divided, with selfish leadership, who puts their own ambition first, isn't doing for our country anymore. We need to change that. And every election is an opportunity to change it. We have people in this race how bad, how angry we should be. And there's certainly sufficient reason for anger at the failures of the leaders we've selected. But they're doing it not for that reason. It's not a moment of honesty and transparency. Believe me, it's not. It's because they believe when we get angry, what we'll do is naturally relate to the angriest voice in the room. Donald Trump wants you to be angry every day because he's angry. He wants you to be angry so that you'll relate to his anger and then to vote for him. Please understand this. I have known him well for 22 years more than anybody else in this race has known him. And I can promise you this, if you put him back behind the desk in the Oval Office and a choice comes and a decision is needed to be made as to whether he puts himself first or he puts you first, how much more evidence do you need that he will pick himself? And if that is what we have there, then people are going to remain angry, remain divided, and become even more exhausted than they are today. You have been listening to Country. former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie live in Wyndham, New Hampshire, at what is his final campaign stop, at least in this presidential race, as he officially suspends his campaign. A moment that NBC News had reported on over the course of the last couple of hours here. The multiple sources suggested he would do, his campaign apparently telling allies, telling people close to Christie that this was coming here. I want to play for you the moment when Christie formally suspended. Listen to what he said. Listen to his rationale. Listen. That there came a point in time in this race where I couldn't see a path to accomplishing that goal that I would get out. And it's clear to me tonight that there isn't a path for me to win the nomination. 
I want to bring in now Shaq Brewster, who is live for us in New Hampshire, John Allen, who is live for us in Iowa. As you see, of course, the governor's event on the left side of your screen. He is continuing to speak, Shaq, in what feels a lot like, frankly, what some of his campaign discussions, what some of his campaign speeches had been about even prior to tonight, and that is a dire warning right. about what he sees as the consequences if Donald Trump were to win, win re-election, were to win this Republican nomination. But Christie also tonight is acknowledging the reality, as he said, there is not a path, it seems, for him to win, and that's why he's bowing out. Here's what we haven't heard, Shaq. We haven't heard him say, and so, instead of voting for me, you should vote for blank that that hasn't come up that's exactly right hallie and you know in some ways he's leaving this campaign in almost the same manner in which he entered this campaign back in june it was in june that he made clear that his rationale for being in this race was because he thought he would be the strongest person to go up and take on donald trump when you talk to his aides and advisors back at the beginning of this campaign they said that just wait until you get that moment where you saw former governor chris christie on the debate stage with donald trump that was a moment that they they thought would be one where you saw the tide turn, where you would see potentially support shift away from Donald Trump and it would help defeat him in this primary. Well, we know that moment never happened. While there were plenty of debates, we never saw Donald Trump enter a debate stage. And while Chris Christie was forceful against Donald Trump, attacking him on issues like character, on fitness, on the legal battles that Donald Trump is facing, he was never able to really take him down in the same way that he talks about taking down other candidates back in 2016. So, Hallie, yes, we, you mentioned that uh, one big headline is yes, we did not, he we heard Chris Christie suspend his campaign, but the other big thing is that he didn't make clear, and he's still speaking right now, so things could shift, but up until this yeah. point, he has not made clear where he wants his supporters to go. His 12% that he's earning in these two polls that we saw come out of New Hampshire yesterday, where those 12% of Republican voters and independents plan to vote in the New Hampshire primary where they should go and where they should shift their attention to. In the past, as he's been uh, kind of uh, uh, corralled to come to this moment, as you had advisors and donors suggesting that he should drop out, he said openly, he'd said this on Morning Joe just last week, that if he, uh, he would consider, I should say, he said he would consider dropping out of this race if you saw Haley, for example, being willing to take on Donald Trump, if you saw other candidates in a stronger position and willing to confront Donald Trump in a way that they haven't up until this point, that has not changed. But clearly something has changed with Governor Christie's campaign, leading him to this moment where he's now suspending it. Shaq Brewster, thank you so much. Let me have you stand by for a second as I want to bring in now John Allen, who has been covering everything about this uh, presidential campaign, of course, this race from Iowa tonight. And John, when you look at some of the polling here, national polls, um, it shows, at least our recent national poll, that 65 percent of Christie voters would vote for Nikki Haley as their second choice, right? And you can see how close that race for second place is here as we pull back up now that live Christie event. Obviously, as Shaq talks about, um, and this is the key graphic here, this is potentially a moment for Nikki Haley, but just moments before Chris Christie started giving this speech, there was a hot mic moment, we talked about it a little bit ago in the show, in which he was apparently talking, presumably about Nikki Haley, saying, suggesting that, again, presumably her, could get smoked. Let me play a little bit of that hot mic moment now for people. Spent 16 million so far, 59 million by DeSantis, and we spent 12. I mean, who's punching above their weight and who's getting a return on their investment, you know? And she's going to get smoked. And you and I both know it. She's not up to this. She hasn't even been... Yeah. She's still 20 points behind Trump in New Hampshire, right? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And he's going to—he's still going to carry out, right? Yes. Always. I, t you know, I talked to De DeSantis. Called me, petrified that I would. He's probably getting out after Iowa. Well, he's. Uh, okay, there's a lot to unpack on that one, John Allen. Uh, as Chris Christie, of course, is still speaking on stage, we're going to listen to see if he does, in fact, make an endorsement. But there's two pieces to this. One, and we got to be careful here. 
We can presume he's talking about Nikki Haley based on that conversation. There's only, you know, one person who's 20 points, one woman who's 20 points behind Donald Trump in New Hampshire. Um, again, presumably Nikki Haley saying she's going to get smoked. You are already seeing other campaigns pick up on this, including, by the way, Donald Trump himself, who, as the in the course of our conversation here in the last four minutes, said, I hear Chris Christie is dropping out of the race to say, said he was just caught on a hot mic saying she's going to get smoked, calling that a very truthful statement here, John. I mean, this is already creating like a whole political thing now. <laughs> I mean, leave it to Chris Christie to uh, leave the race um, with uh, more of a bomb cyclone than he came in. Uh, you know, you said presumably it's Nikki Haley. Um, she is the only woman running on the Republican side. So unless he's talking I'm about just being careful, John. Else, I'm just being cautious here. You know, I'm... I mean, it would be a surprise if he was talking about one of the other candidates, given the pronoun that he used there, Steve. Sure. Yeah. Um, look, all of these candidates are going to say, number one, all the rest of the candidates are going to say, number one, uh, that Chris Christie's right, that Nikki Haley can't win. Uh, and number two, they're going to say that him getting out does not help her. Uh, however, it is very clear that him getting out helps her, at least in the short run in New Hampshire, uh, in talking to voters in New Hampshire over the course of this election, uh, in looking at polling. You can expect that most of the people who support Chris Christie uh, for the Republican nomination will move over to Nikki Haley. And there may be a, an indirect effect on that, right? This is the reason that Ron DeSantis would be petrified if that's, in fact, uh, a, a characterization that is accurate from Chris Christie. The reason would be that voters in Iowa may be affected by the thought that Nikki Haley is now in a position, uh, per perhaps a better position at least, to, to run even with Trump, to have a real fight with him in New Hampshire. That may affect the way that they vote uh, come caucus time uh, on Monday. So uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, but I would uh, back up just a little bit um, and say, uh, you know, when we look at those national polls, we still see in most of them Donald Trump at or above the 50 percent mark. Uh, and I'm not a mathematician, um, <laughs> but if he's going to win uh, more than half the country, uh, then uh, the likelihood is that he's still going to be the Republican nominee. Um, and, you know, we'll have to see what happens. Sometimes uh, what happens in the state uh, can, in fact, affect the rest of the race. So were Nikki Haley to get in a position where she could win in New Hampshire, maybe that would affect future states. But uh, right now, this looks, race still looks like Donald Trump's to lose. And I just want to say, I think you're doing something really important, John, which is pulling back, giving us the macro 30,000-foot view. Because while this is, I think, very interesting and an interesting dynamic here less than a week out from Iowa, as it relates to this discussion that happens with Iowa, as it always does every cycle, about momentum and who gets some wind at their back and do they carry it into New Hampshire and does it change the dynamics of the race going into South Carolina, right? This is the arc and Super Tuesday over the next few months. The bottom line is this. Donald Trump right now is still stomping the rest of this race by double digits in every key early state that matters right now. That is simply what the numbers are telling us. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. Um, you can't fight the numbers. Uh, and look, uh, again, Nikki Haley will probably get a nice burst, a nice boost in New Hampshire from uh, Chris Christie getting out. Probably didn't help her much that he uh, appears to have said uh, that she's going to get smoked and even more that she's not up for this, um, if, in fact, he was talking about Haley. So uh, that's something you're going to hear on repeat, um, certainly from Donald Trump. You'll probably hear it from Ron DeSantis. Uh, you'll probably hear it from Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, and, you know, Haley is going to do her best to beat Trump in New Hampshire and try to get a little bit of momentum headed into Nevada, which nobody even talks about anymore. Uh, but it seems to be Trump country. And then her own home state of South Carolina, where she is trailing badly in the polls. We are also hearing now from our colleague Dasha Burns, John Allen, before I let you go, I just want to mention it, and forgive me, I'm reading off of my computer here, that a source has now confirmed that Governor Ron DeSantis called Christie earlier today. You heard Christie mention a phone call from DeSantis in that hot mic moment, called Christie today after hearing rumors of him possibly dropping out, called to say that regardless of his decision, he appreciated his role in the race, saying that Christie then, in that phone call, went after Haley pretty hard. So listen, a lot of sort of political dynamics at play here. We're going to talk, talk about it more next hour. John Allen, thank you so much. Appreciate you being with us. Great NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, parents protesting in New York City today after a high school temporarily housed migrants during that bad storm overnight. The school took in about 2,000 people, which is about 500 families. Students were remote for the day for classes. The school apparently got multiple 
hate-related phone calls, even a bomb threat, which was cleared by police. Also out of our Northeast Bureau, a woman in Massachusetts is suspected of poisoning her husband with tainted soup. According to court documents, she was texting somebody posing as a star from a daytime soap opera who told her to get rid of her husband. The person also apparently scammed her into giving them money. The woman says the soup was old, not poison. Her husband survived and his tox reports came back negative. Police are still investigating. And out of our Southern Bureau, officials say a huge fire destroyed a building in San Antonio today. Look at this video here. You can see the walls just collapsing. This all happened. The whole thing went up in a matter of minutes. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but officials are still trying to figure out what caused it. A Democratic lawmaker tonight joining in on some calls for the defense secretary to step down after that whole controversy on how he waited to tell the White House about his hospitalization and then stay in the ICU after complications from surgery to treat prostate cancer. The congressman saying today he has lost trust in Secretary Lloyd Austin's leadership, this is Chris Deluzio, because of his lack of transparency. Now that is adding to a degree to the pressure that we've already been seeing on Austin, at least from members of Congress on the Republican side, with a threat now to impeach Secretary Austin. He's not the only one. They're also hoping to impeach the AG. That's on top of the impeachment inquiries already against the Homeland Security Secretary and, of course, the impeachment inquiry into President Biden himself. The White House today says Republicans in the House are treating impeachments like an Oprah audience giveaway instead of focusing on things that actually affect voters. Kelly O'Donnell is joining us now. So presumably, Kelly, from the White House perspective, it's you get an impeachment and you get an impeachment. That's how they're trying to cast this whole thing. Um, talk about how this is playing out, particularly when it comes to the fact that here we are in 2024 in an election year. Well, certainly impeachment could be a tool used by either party. Those who are engaging in trying to impeach can use it as a political tool to say those in power don't deserve to be reelected and those who are the subject of the attack can use it in order to say it has been diluted into a meaningless level of uh, rebuke and criticism. So it is fraught with politics and it is no longer the rare domain of grave circumstances. We have seen that evolve over the last couple of generations and now it's becoming a go-to part of the political toolkit. Certainly the White House is viewing this as uh, a situation where uh, the talk of impeachment doesn't match the facts and is therefore an example of uh, using this as a tool instead of being focused on what the public wants. That's certainly part of what the White House has indicated. Ian Sams, who is one of the uh, spokespeople for the Office of White House Counsel, who's dealing with these issues, certainly swatted it down that way, where he talked about uh, the need for people to focus on what the public needs. That's really up to the voters to decide as they're hearing all of this, but it has certainly changed. This is not your father or grandfather's impeachment in the current moment. Uh, they're playing off an old Oldsmobile ad for you, Hallie. <laughs> Kelly O'Donnell, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's good to see you tonight live from, of course, the North Lawn of the White House. A lot more to come here on the show, including Aaron Rodgers, sidelined a little ahead of schedule on ESPN. So will this mean the end of all that controversy between him and Jimmy Kimmel and Pat McAfee? Oof, we're going to get into it in a sec. Tonight, breaking news as we are coming on the air, as we are on the air, actually, with the field of candidates in the race for the Republican presidential nomination getting smaller tonight. Chris Christie, in just the last couple of minutes, officially announcing he's suspending his campaign. Why he says he didn't see a path. His pretty tough hot mic moments about somebody still in the race, presumably, and whether he could endorse somebody now. Plus, out west, the frantic search for anybody who may have been caught in a deadly avalanche at a popular Tahoe ski resort. That's just some of the fallout from those massive and deadly storms slamming the U.S. We're live with what's next for the hundreds of thousands of people without power and the forecast for the millions still at risk of even more bad weather. Then a stunner in Washington as Hunter Biden surprises everybody by just showing up in front of a Republican committee, trying to discipline him for not showing up in front of a Republican committee. Why the GOP is so furious on the politics front and what's next for the president's son tomorrow on the legal front. 
Plus, some new reporting tonight. First into NBC News about a new lawsuit facing Starbucks. Is their coffee really as ethically sourced as they say? And the whole country under lockdown tonight after a prison break by one of Ecuador's most notorious drug lords. Why things are spiraling there in a story we've been on top of since it broke later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we are coming on the air just minutes after former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie came out and made an announcement that he frankly had been under some pressure to make, that he is suspending his campaign for president. Listen to this. That there came a point in time in this race where I couldn't see a path to accomplishing that goal that I would get out. And it's clear to me tonight that there isn't a path for me to win the nomination. There is no path, he says. Christie's not leaving the race quietly, of course, even if by accident, caught on a hot mic before this whole event started, talking potentially about some of his opponents in the race, presumably. Listen. Spent 16 million so far, 59 million by DeSantis, and we spent 12. I mean, who's punching above their weight and who's getting a return on their investment, you know? And she's going to get smoked. And you and I both know it. She's not up to this. She hasn't even been. And she's still 20 points behind Trump in New Hampshire, right? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And he's, gonna, he's still going to carry out, right? Yes. Oh, he's, I, t you know, I talked to De DeSantis called me, petrified he's that probably, I would. He's probably getting out after Iowa. Well, he's petrified. She's getting smoked, he says, presumably talking about Nikki Haley. Let me bring in NBC's Shaq Brewster, who is live for us in Wyndham, New Hampshire, covering, of course, Christie's campaign event. Ali Vitale is live for us in Des Moines, Iowa, with the impact more broadly. Our Mark Murray is joining us as well. Okay, Shaq, so talk us through it, right? Why tonight? Why now? Give us a sense of the vibe, the mood in the room, and what we think could happen next. Well, Hallie, the timing was a question that was not addressed in his speech. It was a formal speech almost that Governor Christie gave. I've attended many of his events, and very rarely does he actually read from a script. And this time you saw him try to really hit some key points in this speech that he gave. It was at this town hall event. One thing that he wanted to make clear was that he didn't want to make the same mistake in his words that he made in 2016. Then he said he allowed ambition to go over what he did or what he thought was wrong. Right. He did not want to go and just uh, go and endorse someone just because of the ambition that he had. Instead, he said he wanted to keep the focus on Donald Trump. But he signaled, and you heard it even in those comments before his speech, he signaled that he still wants to be a factor in this race, even if he is not a candidate in this race. And Hallie, we heard him end his campaign very similar to how he started his campaign, by attacking Donald Trump forcefully, by saying that he was not morally fit to be president that he has legal troubles that he's going to uh, get tied in. He said that while this is a sad day for him, while he and his wife are disappointed, he signaled his voice is not going away. So we can expect to see Governor Chris Christie doing what he did when he was a candidate, even now beyond, now that he's suspended his campaign. Shaq, stand by for just a second. Ali Vitale, I want to go to you here because we mentioned those hot mic moments where Christie, even as he's getting out, yeah. still fired a few shots, right? And Nikki Haley presumably saying she's going to get smoked. Somebody jumps in, says she's 20 points back in New Hampshire. You know who's aware of those comments? The DeSantis campaign reacting to it tonight, <laughs> agreeing. <laughs> Donald Trump is aware of those comments reacting tonight, agreeing. Has the, I have to think the Haley campaign is, too. Are they saying anything about this or about Christie dropping out more generally and what it could mean for them? Because there is, as Jack has pointed out, a lot of discussion that this could potentially give her something of a momentum boost. Yeah, certainly none of that is lost on any of these campaigns who are here on the ground in Iowa. I got to tell you, Hallie, that hot mic recording is sort of like my new Roman Empire. I do think that it's so telling what the candidates say behind the scenes when they think no one is listening. And certainly Chris Christie, not a stranger to giving it to people straight, clearly talking there akin to how a DeSantis source says he spoke with the Florida governor on the phone today. Of course, this source not engaging on the idea that Christie said that DeSantis was 
in his words, petrified. But this source saying that on the call that DeSantis made to the former New Jersey governor, he said he was calling because he heard he might be dropping out. He appreciated the role he played in this race. And that Christie, according to this DeSantis world source, was making jokes about Haley, that he said she was a joke, that he was going at her and attacking her, saying that she was going to lose in this endeavor to become the president and the heir apparent to former President Donald Trump. Certainly, that's what we heard Christie seemed to echo there as he was talking backstage and caught on a hot mic, saying that despite all of the tens of millions of dollars that have been spent on this race, there's not much return on investment for people not named Donald Trump. Christie, of course, though, leaving the race with that blistering criticism, Shaq pointed this out, leaving as he entered this race, making it all about Trump. But in terms of the way that this impacts on the ground in New Hampshire, the Haley folks, despite the public jabs about those slavery comments that she failed to make, and despite the jabs in that hot mic, they're saying that this underscores the fact that it's a two-person race, Trump versus Haley. And they feel like on the ground in New Hampshire, and Mark will get into this, that having one less person, and specifically that one less person being Christie, will only serve to benefit them, whether or not it gets them the 8 to 10 to 15 points that they actually need to eclipse Trump. I don't know about that. We'll see. But it certainly helps. At least that's their view right now. I'm going to get to Mark in just one second, Allie, but our viewers will notice that you are uh, indoors in Iowa, not just for your own uh, comfort <laughs> Thanks, and safety Allie. in the warmth, but because <laughs> we're looking ahead tonight to some candidate events. I have to think that in this discussion between Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, Christie dropping out could potentially come up. So I think that when Shaq says that the why now wasn't referenced by Christie, that's a question that I was talking about with my sources throughout most of the day, because the thinking might have been, hey, wouldn't have this been better if you watched what happened in Iowa and then made an endorsement, sort of showing the boost that you can give? Instead, I think the explanation might serve that Christie is not on this debate stage in person, but now he is there in ideology and outright Trumpian criticism. He really did call out the rest of the field here, and he did this when he was sharing a debate debate stage with them just a month ago. But now it really is going to be incumbent, frankly, on CNN, who's moderating this debate, to make this a part of the conversation. This is Haley versus DeSantis. They've spent a lot of time going at each other. But as Chris Christie pointed out, neither of them are the front runner. And so the idea that Christie could somehow nudge the rest of the field to stop ignoring the Trump in the room, I think that was the reason for the why now moment. At least that would make the most sense here, because he does get to steer this conversation conversation. And certainly that's been Christie's goal the entire time. For someone like Nikki Haley, yeah. we've seen her start to put some Trump criticism into her stump speech here in New Hampshire. But the criticism is pretty much nibbling around the edges, saying that chaos follows him. She's not going at him. She says she'll criticize him when it's necessary. She'll defend herself. But she's been pretty careful and delicate in the dance that she's done. DeSantis, too, similarly, not going after Trump for the multiple indictment counts that he's now facing all the time that he's yeah. spending in court. So I think Christie was trying to force the issue here, and we'll see if he was able to do it. You know, Ali, thank you so much. Shaq, thank you. Mark Murray, Shaq, I'm going to let you go back in in case Christy answers questions. I know you want to be there for that. Go, go, please, friend. Thank you. Mark Murray, let me go to you here because Al, you heard Ali mention how Nikki Haley is working this idea of chaos into her stump speech a little bit more and more. That is also what she's talking about in the brand new statement that is just out now from her about Christy dropping out, saying Chris Christie has been a friend for many years. She says, I commend him on a hard-fought campaign. She goes on to say that voters have a clear choice, the chaos and drama of the past, or a new generation of conservative leadership. And that new generation, you see her statement here, that new generation idea has been part of her closing argument as she rounds the corner into Iowa and then New Hampshire. 65%, according to our polls, 65% of um, Christie supporters say that Nikki Haley would be their second choice. So it seems fair to say that she is the one who has the most to gain out of this from Christie suspending his campaign, but ultimately, Mark, it is Donald Trump who is still firmly in the lead in polls in this race. Yeah, Hallie, I think you summed it up really, really well. It does help on paper for Chris Christie getting out of the race, helps Nikki Haley in a place like New Hampshire. And as you mentioned, that one poll from CNN and the University of New Hampshire, 65% of Christie's backers have Haley as their second choice. And there's a similar Suffolk poll that came out as well. And that one ended up showing about 48% of Christie's uh, backers ended up having uh, Haley as their second choice. And my bat 
my kind of back of envelope math, that's worth about five, six, seven, eight points in a horse race contest. But I think the other part of the equation that you ended up summing up very well is that in other contests like Iowa, as well as nationally, some of the Super Tuesday states, Donald Trump is already at or above 50% in those races. And so, uh, you know, if, if he's already at 50%, that means that in places that aren't New Hampshire, uh, Nikki, Nikki Haley needs other help. And so that is her challenge, even with Christie out of the contest. Mark Murray, thank you so much. Our thanks to Shaq and Ali before you as well. Lots to cover here tonight, but there's also lots to cover on a different front, and that is the weather, because we're seeing some serious and deadly aftermath of those storms that ripped through the country, apparently contributing, at least in part, to a massive avalanche at a popular Tahoe ski resort. We have just learned in the last hour that one man was killed, one person was hurt, Two other people, according to officials, were found and got out in this update that we just got in the last couple of minutes. They say the rescue operation is now wrapped up. Nobody else, they say, is still stuck on the mountain. They have searched, and that is their assessment at this point. The mountain, it's called uh, Palisades Tahoe, you see it here, got shut down for the day as the investigation is obviously still happening as to how this avalanche went off in the first place. Obviously, the Sierra Nevada's got a lot of snow in that storm that ripped from coast to coast, that series of storms, rather. And even tonight, a lot of the country is still under winter alerts. A lot of concern out east about flooding. New England is seeing some torrential rain. There's a mandatory evacuation that was ordered earlier today in Connecticut along a river there because a dam partially collapsed. People had to go shelter at a school because officials warned that it was really hazardous here. You've got on the travel front more than 500 delays across the country. That's the domino effect of those ground stops at big airports overnight. And if you're sort of taking a beat here, there's still more to come on the other side of this thing. Because over the next week, there's the possibility of a bomb cyclone blizzard in the Midwest an Arctic blast, thanks to the polar vortex, and maybe the first real East Coast snowstorm in years. We've got Emily Aketa, who is on the ground live for us in New Jersey tonight. Meteorologist Bill Karens is standing by as well. Emily, let me start with you on what we're actually just learning in the last few minutes out west, that terrifying avalanche and the frantic search for any survivors in a rescue operation that appears tonight to have been wrapped up. Yeah, hey there, Hallie. Well, you look across the country right now, tens of millions of people are reeling from a mass massive winter storm system, and now we've got this other one barreling into the west where an avalanche, as you mentioned, happened earlier this morning short around the time of 9.30 a.m. at a major ski resort at a time when so many people are flocking to the area to take advantage of the slopes there. Officials just speaking out in a news conference confirming tragically one person died, another person we learned was injured, both we're told were guests from out of town. There was a massive emergency response to the area, more than 100 personnel from Palisades alone, not to mention uh, the governor had also said that Cal Fire would assist in the, with, along with a number of other agencies. They're looking at the response and there was no word on the coming days, but we know that the resort was closed for today uh, as a result of the avalanche and this massive search system. As you mentioned, uh, the, the search has appeared to be concluded there have been no other people reported missing at this time Hallie and what about where you are Emily because obviously the concern now the flooding the rain in the east coast of the country as we speak and then of course the potential for more snow down the road yeah, that's right, Hallie. You can see the floodwaters lingering around me. This is Patterson, New Jersey. Parts of the Northeast was were, were hammered with nearly five inches of rain from this massive storm system that brought tornadoes to the south. It brought snow to the Midwest, and it brought just absolutely torrential rain to the Northeast, resulting in these flooded communities. And the nearby Passaic River is still rising. It could remain in flood stage through at least Saturday, leading to so many frustrations and concerns from nearby residents. Here's one resident I spoke to. Take a listen. Everything is flooded. The basement is flooded. Uh, the last time I lost everything. Like, you know, and the most important thing were the pictures that I have when my kids were babies. You can't have nothing nice, especially in your basement, because you know it's going to get flooded. And tonight, Hallie, tens of thousands of people are still without power. Allie. Emily Aketa live for us there in Patterson, New Jersey. Emily, thank you. Let me get to Bill Karens now, who's got more on the forecast. What is next, Bill, with so many people bracing for the worst? 
Yeah, we have this huge storm. It's going to look identical to the one we just got done with. And then we have this crazy Arctic blast behind it. I mean, it's, it happens. It's, you know, middle of winter, but we just haven't had one in a long time. So here's the storm that's caused all the problems today with that avalanche. This is bringing heavy snow to many areas of the Intermountain West. A lot of the ski resorts are going to get some heavy snow over the next couple of days because of this. That's where all our winter storm warnings are. And because the storm's going to be heading out in the middle of the country and likely becoming a blizzard by the time we get to Friday, we have winter storm warnings for Omaha already, Des Moines, a whole state of Iowa is under a winter storm watch or a winter storm warning. Chicago, this could be your big snowstorm of the winter. And they also areas around Milwaukee and central Michigan. So how much snow are we expecting at this point? Well, the mountainous areas will get over a foot. You can expect that. Omaha right now, somewhere right around maybe four to six inches. Same for Des Moines. When we get towards Chicago, right now we have you about a half a foot north of you, up towards Milwaukee to Green Bay, right along the lakeshore. That could be a foot. A huge chunk of Michigan could get a foot of snow. And then kind of a wintry mess from Kansas City to Indianapolis. And by the way, northern New England doesn't even get much snow out of this one. This is primarily an event for the West and heading into the Great Lakes and Midwest. So here's how we all time this up. And the one part of the storm I haven't mentioned yet that sadly we're going to have to deal with again, and that's severe weather with this storm. Hopefully we will not have the 24 tornadoes that we had with this last one, but we do have the possibility of at least a few strong ones. We'll start this thread as we go throughout late Thursday night. This is Friday morning with the storms over Louisiana. We track the storms all the way through the south into the south southeast by Friday night. It does look like if we're going to get the really strong storms, the tornadoes, they would likely be in areas from Alabama, a good chunk of Georgia, south of Atlanta, and into areas of the Carolinas. And then, of course, behind this, that hurt, you know, really big blast of cold air. You know, Hallie, we're not going to break a lot of record lows, but we just haven't seen temperatures like this. I mean, highs are going to be, yeah. you know, zero in Des Moines over the weekend. And even on by the time I we know. it's going to be like seven degrees on caucus day. Yeah, I, I tried on all my scarves and hats and gloves today, Bill, as I'm packing up. You'll so look thank great. you for that. Oh, appreciate you. Thank you, Bill. Much more to come, I know, on that front. Appreciate it. Let's get you back here to Washington because, boy, if tonight has been full of breaking news, there is more of it from the Capitol. And that is because a second House committee now has voted along party lines to recommend that the president's son, Hunter Biden be held in contempt of Congress for defying a subpoena. That's after essentially the same vote by a different committee. It would have to go to the full House still. But it's the cap to what was a pretty bananas day at the Capitol. Because of this, look at this. This is Hunter Biden straight showing up. Surprise! He's here on Capitol Hill to walk into a committee hearing room like, hey, I'll talk. He was escorted by Secret Service. You see his lawyers, one of his reps with him, too. He shows up, sits in the front row, like right in the dais, or right in front of the dais, rather, where members of the public would sit. There he is, arms crossed, listening to the proceedings. And there were, there was plenty to listen to because things got dramatic. It was chaotic. I'm just going to stop talking and let you listen to what happened between some of the members of the committee. Watch. You are the epitome of white privilege coming into the oversight committee, spitting in our face, ignoring a congressional subpoena to be deposed. What are you afraid of? You have no balls to come up here and... M Mr. Chairman, point of inquiry. Mr. Chairman, um... I, if the, the lady recognizes... If, if, the gentle, if the gentlelady Please wants to hear from names. Hunter Biden, we can hear from him right now, Mr. And Chairman. Let's take a vote Christ and hear from I'm Hunter speaking. Biden. What are you afraid of? Hold on, hold on, of? hold on. Hold on. Order, Biden, order. Guys, Hunter Biden should be arrested right here, right now, and go straight to jail. The United States Congress, Sahil Kapoor, is joining us now. Um, Sahil, talk us through some of the dynamics here, right? Because House Republicans had wanted Hunter Biden to come in and answer questions behind closed doors. Hunter Biden basically said, now, nah, I don't want to do that, but I'll do it publicly. So they said, well, wait a second, you're defying a subpoena. We're going to hold you contempt. He shows up. It feels like to try to make some kind of a statement here about his willingness to speak publicly. Talk us through it. Yeah, that's all correct, Hallie. It, the vote in the House Oversight Committee that landed just moments ago was 25 to 21. It was purely on party lines to hold Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress for failing to comply with a lawful subpoena. That was the committee, by the way, that Hunter Biden uh, showed up to earlier today uh, at a, on kind of a surprise, unannounced visit uh, to the hearing. Before that, earlier today, the House Judiciary Committee, the second committee with jurisdiction on this, voted 23 to 14, also along party lines, to hold Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress for the exact same thing. Now this goes to the full House of Representatives, which needs to vote by a majority vote. Republicans have a narrow majority there, but they can get this passed if they stick together. And then it would go to the Justice Department. A U.S. attorney in Washington would have the decision to make as to whether to prosecute Hunter Biden uh, which could come with a fine and jail time 
for refusing to comply with a congressional subpoena. The Justice Department, not Congress, will have the last word here. After that House oversight uh, vote just moments ago, James Comer, the chairman of that committee, uh, who we saw engaging in some of that back and forth on the screen, said, quote, Hunter Biden refused to comply with lawful subpoenas requiring he appear for a deposition. Meanwhile, Hunter Biden has shown he has no problem showing up on Capitol Hill to engage in political stunts, unquote. Now, Hunter's whole purpose for showing up was to try to signal to the public, signal to people that he's not afraid of this investigation, that he is willing to testify before Republicans. He's simply not going to do it privately behind closed doors as they had demanded because he worries that they're going to twist his words, Hallie. Sahil Kapoor, thank you very much for that. We've got some other news out of D.C. from the Transportation Secretary saying tonight that Boeing understands the gravity of the situations that come out of that Alaska Airlines incident. You know the one where that door plug essentially got blown out of the side of the plane while it was in midair. Here's Transportation Secretary Buttigieg talking with our own Tom Costello not too long ago. Every plane that they deliver to an airline, every plane that goes into the skies needs to be 100% safe. And they need to be able to demonstrate that, which means finding and fixing anything related to this issue, whether it's directly or indirectly related. So you now have both United and Alaska Airlines, the two airlines that fly the MAX 9, that particular plane, canceling more of those flights today. Remember, that's the model that had the safety issue there. Um, in a new statement, Alaska says you should expect more cancellations even through Saturday as it waits for inspection procedures so it can check out all of its other MAX 9s. The reason this is all happening, apparently because of a quality escape at some point in the process, according to Boeing's CEO, a quality escape. Hold that thought, hold that question. I want to play for you first him talking about this on CNBC a little earlier. Watch. Whatever information we get or glean, we will, we will look everywhere around the max, around the spirit factories, our own factories, our inspection processes, and we'll make sure that we take steps to ensure that it never, never can happen again. Tom Costello is joining us now. Okay, so Tom, there have been a lot of pieces of news coming out on this today. Notably, of course, what we're hearing from the head of Boeing, and notably, what we're hearing from the guy who's in charge of the transportation apparatus in this country, and that is Secretary Buttigieg. Walk us through some of the highlights here, and then secondarily, more on the sort of quality escape piece of things that Boeing's talking about. Okay, so the bottom line here is that, as you mentioned, both Alaska and United still have their fleets grounded. About 146 planes, more or less, I think it is. No flights, no MAX 9 flights are flying because they still haven't started the inspection process of those MAX 9s. And the reason is because the FAA and Boeing are still trying to work out the precision, the engineering precision, with which they do the inspections and then whatever fix would be required. And this is important now. The bottom line is the fuselage for the MAX 9 is made by a company called Spirit Aerosystems out of Wichita, Kansas. They essentially produce the tube. They give the tube to Boeing. Boeing produces the plane. They fix it out. They put the electronics in it, the seats, everything else. So the question is, well, if there was a, some sort of a quality control breakdown, or he said quality escape, the, where did it happen? Well, you heard from CEO David Calhoun. It's not clear if it happened either with Spirit Aerosystems in Wichita, with, which produced the tube, or at Boeing. And listen, Boeing has the last hands on that piece, right? Because Spirit gives them this big empty tube, and then Boeing has to fit it all out. So the question is, where was the breakdown? How did this defect apart? And it now appears that Boeing is admitting that there was a quality problem, a serious quality problem. Where did it happen, at Boeing or at Spirit? Didn't happen at Alaska Airlines, right? They just, it was a brand new plane, and they started flying it, as they should. They don't rip apart the walls, checking the bolts. So that's the issue right now. Spirit Aerosystems did, by the way, give us a statement, and essentially they said they continue to cooperate with the NTSB, with the FAA, and they are supporting that investigation uh, throughout. That's what you would expect. They are a party to the investigation, along with Boeing, of course, Alaska Airlines as well. Tom Costello, thank you so much. Uh, it is great to see you, as you have been doing all along here, reporting this out and continuing to do so. Let's talk about another cabinet member now, a different secretary, the Secretary of State, who's in key meetings with the Palestinian leader in the West Bank as part of this intense trip to the region here, with the U.S. pushing Israel to try to scale back its war, take a more targeted approach, and embrace some kind of a plan for the Gaza Strip once this war eventually ends. That brings us to tonight's original, now in-depth reporting on a story we've been watching. 
with our Keir Simmons going in depth on what it could take to get Israel to scale back. Tens of thousands have been killed, say the United Nations and Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry, among them thousands of women and children. <laughs> and thousands of Hamas fighters are dead too, say the Israelis. Yet one man is still alive, according to Hamas, its leader, Yahya Sinwar. While if Israel had located him, it would likely say so. Israel's failure to find Sinwar and many others in the Hamas high command is one reason its pledge to dismantle Hamas is far from fulfilled, meaning peace may be a long way off. We travelled to Beirut, Lebanon, to where last week the Hamas second-in-command died in a drone strike. Israel has not admitted it was behind the hit, but finding Salah al aruri who had links to Iran, would have required a sophisticated spying operation. This local store owner, who says an air conditioner from the apartment smashed through his window, was amazed Hamas was there. You never saw anyone living there? La, 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 la. Not one time, he says. There, the hole in the roof where the munitions broke through before exploding, sending shrapnel hurtling across the street. This tree set on fire. This car incinerated. A textbook targeted assassination that risked killing many civilians. Israel has a long, controversial history of targeting its enemies back to the 1950s. Its attempt to kill Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat in Lebanon and beyond were called Operation Saltfish. And after 11 Israeli athletes were killed at the Munich Olympics, it methodically tracked down the terrorists involved with deadly results. But Israel has also often slipped up. In 2010, the assassination of a Hamas leader in Dubai caused international uproar when the killers, in disguise, were caught on hotel cameras. Now the heads of Israel's intelligence and security agencies, Mossad and Shin Bet, are vowing to hunt down all those behind the massacre of October 7th, where 1,200 people died and some 240 were taken hostage. A person familiar with the Israeli government's thinking tells NBC News Qatar and Turkey have unofficial immunity from strikes against Hamas leaders there. Foreign diplomats and former U.S. officials agree. With Hamas still holding hostages, Israel would be reluctant to undermine a communication channel through Qatar. We travelled to the capital of Qatar, Doha, to talk to a member of Hamas's political wing. Bassem Naim says many of his family in Gaza have been killed, seemingly in targeted strikes. Any leadership, he, will, uh, he, he is expecting at some time to be targeted. Including you? Including me. He claims that efforts to keep the Hamas leader and mastermind of October 7th alive is just like the US protecting its presidents. I am sure the security uh, instructions for someone like Joe Biden is not the security instructions for you in any case. Is Yahya Sinwar still in Gaza? This is the last information I have. Israel's hunt for the Hamas high command is pivotal. The country has accused Hamas of using civilians as human shields, as has the United Nations. And those who study Hamas say it may hold on to some hostages simply to protect its leaders. Hamas itself says it will not hand over all the hostages without a ceasefire. Israel, caught between a deepening humanitarian crisis in Gaza with an escalating civilian death toll and the fear among some that to stop fighting while the Hamas leadership is still in place, will look like a defeat. Keir Simmons is joining us now. Keir, uh, excellent reporting as always. One of the things you mentioned there at the end, of course, is the civilians who have been killed in Gaza. There are these big Hague hearings over the genocide mm. accusations Israel's facing that start tomorrow. What should we be expecting to see? How do we think that's going to go? Well, a process like that takes a long time. Uh, it is South Africa that is taking this action, accusing Israel of genocide at the International Court of Justice. Now, uh, Halley, family members of hostages will go there too to try to mm. remind the court about what this is all about, about October 7th, about the, the agony that Israel has gone through. And Secretary Blinken has described the action by South Africa as meritless, but Israel is a signatory uh, to that, that court. Uh, now, the, aside from the legal side, what it really underscores, though, Halley, is the point we're making in that report, which is that effectively Israel, and it isn't getting talked about quite like this enough, is in a pincer movement. Uh, it, it has its war aims. It hasn't achieved them, like, for example, reaching the leader of Hamas. And at the same time, international criticism is growing louder with action like tomorrow 
at that core. But the danger of, a, of an international, a regional escalation uh, in the Red Sea or in, in the north of Israel increases and increases and increases. And then, of course, there's the humanitarian crisis. So for Israel, it is in a very, very difficult position. Aside from the domestic politics in Israel, it is stuck. It is in a bind between what it is what the government there has been saying it's trying to achieve, and, and you could describe it as the walls closing in. Ali. Keir Simmons, thank you so much for that reporting. Coming up here on the show, a lot more to get to, including shockwaves. And that is, like, not overstating it, shockwaves in the sports world with Nick Saban reportedly retiring as the football coach of Alabama. More on what we're learning in just a minute. Plus, officials in Spain warning of an environmental crisis tonight. What they say is washing up on beaches. What is that? Some new reporting tonight that was first into NBC News on a lawsuit filed against Starbucks that claims its coffee and tea is sourced from some suppliers with human rights and labor abuses, even though Starbucks advertises otherwise. Remember, you see it everywhere, right? Starbucks has 100% ethical sourcing on its products. Here's the K-cups, coffee bags. You see the label there. Starbucks does use a certification program, they say, to verify suppliers follow their ethical standards. But some experts say the way such programs work is extremely flawed and, frankly, not working very well. This new lawsuit claims Starbucks knowingly sources from farms with documented abuses. For example, the lawsuit cites reporting by an investigative news outlet, Reporter Brasil, which says in inspectors found slave and child labor violations at several Starbucks-certified coffee farms in Brazil. Starbucks spokesperson says they plan to aggressively defend against the claims that Starbucks misrepresented its ethical sourcing commitments. I want to bring in legal analyst Dana Savalos to break this down for us. We talked about false advertising lawsuits, false advertising claims a lot on this show before. So what does this lawsuit want Starbucks to do? Source from different farms or what? or stop advertising the way they're advertising. And this is not a traditional lawsuit where you're seeking what's called legal or money damages, although they can factor in. But really, the main gist of this lawsuit is really injunctive relief to force Starbucks to stop using these advertisements. And uh, looking at the claims, I am a little intrigued by the word committed. It's funny, the word committed may not be much of a commitment. Uh, and I say that because what if Starbucks re responds that we never said we are, we guarantee 100 percent ethical sourcing. We're committed to it. So we're working towards it, darn it. Maybe that might be an argument that it, and it may sound hyper technical, but if you're complaining about false advertising, every word matters, as does the context. Starbucks publicizes what they call farmer support centers, showing where they source from, but it's not clear which specific suppliers are certified, so obviously the tracking piece of things becomes a little bit more difficult. Do you see a case here that big companies should have more transparency on this kind of thing? Well, large companies already have some transparency when they are public companies or publicly traded companies. There is a degree of transparency there. Uh, but, uh, yes, I mean, this could lead to, to a sea change uh, in the world of advertisement for ethical sourcing, which is a relatively recent concept. I mean, certainly in the last decade or so, uh, this now becomes it becomes a question to what degree are consumers even misled. It, it's interesting because they're, they're not really misleading the consumer about the actual content of the coffee. They're not selling them something other than coffee beans, but it's that kind of goodwill that the modern consumer cares about. Uh, they ca the modern consumer cares about ethical sourcing, and that may be the difference between choosing Starbucks, based on what they say on their label, and some other brand. Even though Starbucks may cost more money, uh, modern consumers uh, may turn or be deceived by advertising that leads them to feel good inside about what they're buying. Danny Savalos, thank you very much for that breakdown. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a federal judge is ruling today that Alabama will be allowed to put an inmate to death with nitrogen gas. This would be the first execution in this country using this new method. The inmates' lawyers say it's cruel and experimental, but they're going to appeal the decision. Number two, police say a Buffalo Bills fan was shot and killed after Sunday night's game against the Miami Dolphins in Florida. Dylan Isaacs and his friends were heading to their car when they apparently got into a confrontation with another driver. That driver, according to officials, pulled out a gun and shot Isaacs, who died on scene, according to police. They say they've questioned a suspect and are still investigating, but no arrest has been made.
Number three, University of Alabama football coach Nick Saban is reportedly retiring, according to multiple outlets, including ESPN. If you follow college football, you know what a big, big deal this is. He's been with the program for 17 seasons. He won Alabama six national titles. He is a five-time SEC coach of the year. And here's one other number for you. He's 72, right? He's, he's taking a break, it sounds like. Number four, engine maker Cummins Incorporated will recall 600,000 Ram trucks as part of a nearly $2 billion settlement with the Justice Department, along with the EPA and the California AG's office. This is the biggest ever settlement of its kind, secured under the state's Clean Air Act. The company will also have to fix environmental damage caused by illegal software in its cars and trucks that let it cheat emissions testing. Cummins has denied these allegations. Number five, a new device is gonna let you control technology with your tongue. It's called Mouthpad. It attaches to the roof of your mouth. It's gonna let you scroll, type, even play chess with just the swipe of your tongue. The company, Augmental, says it was created to help people living with disabilities. It's gonna be available to the public later on this year. Pretty incredible. When we come back, the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, making his first court appearance since being transferred to a penal colony. His new comments with the news he's making, coming up in just a sec. An entire country under lockdown tonight with fear in Ecuador. Soldiers walking the streets, schools and stores closed. So many people at home as the country is reeling from violence. It's a story we've been bringing you all week. First, when a notorious cartel leader escaped from prison. Then yesterday, remember, with that attack at a TV station, these people coming in, look at that, during a live broadcast, putting a stick of dynamite in the anchor's pocket, incredibly scary. All of it stemming from what the Ecuadorian president calls an internal armed conflict with drug trafficking gangs. Thing is, what's happening in Ecuador is just one piece of a bigger puzzle, right? The drug trafficking that ends up with drugs in the United States, fueling, of course, addiction issues. So you've got the U.S. weighing in on the whole thing, too, today. Guad Venegas has more. Ecuador is under lockdown tonight as government forces clash with drug cartels across the country. A powder keg of violence exploding after one of the nation's most notorious cartel leaders was found missing in his prison cell over the weekend. Then the incident that shocked the world. Masked gunmen interrupting a live TV broadcast holding journalists hostage. Police stormed the station arresting the gunmen and all hostages were released. But Ecuador's new president still vowing to restore calm in the streets. Violent deaths rising in Ecuador, more than 8,000 last year. Its government says making it one of the most dangerous countries in Latin America. Behind Ecuador's troubles, something experts call narco-terrorism. Drug trafficking groups want to expand the production of narcotics to make a profit. At some point, they come in conflict with the state, and then they resort to terrorist tactics. And what happens in Ecuador doesn't necessarily stay there. It's sandwiched between what the U.N. says are the world's largest cultivators of cocaine, Colombia and Peru. The latter just declaring a state of emergency on its northern border with Ecuador. Very small country plays a very big role in the supply chain economics for multi-ton quantities of cocaine that transit through Ecuador to Mexico and then to the United States. The U.S. closely watching what's happening. Certainly, uh, we were willing to talk with the government of Ecuador about what they might need. Ecuador's president reconsidering the country's ban on extraditions of internationally wanted criminals and seizing assets from suspects. But experts say it could take a whole lot more than that. An all-out military effort to neutralize not just the cartel members, but all the individuals who support the cartel, the bankers, the lawyers, the individuals who help them launder their money. For now, Ecuador just trying to stabilize the situation as the country is up in flames. No, 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 no. It's just so scary to see Guad is joining us now. And Guad, for obvious reasons, there are some Ecuadorians who want to leave, who want to get out. And there's a ripple effect from that, right? Hallie, of all the reporting we've done at the U.S.-Mexico border, I think every single visit that we've made with my crew, uh, we ran into individuals who left Ecuador. When we mm. talk to them, they always say they are fleeing the violence. And if you look at numbers, Customs and Border Protection released the numbers for 2023 fiscal year. They encountered about 117,000 people from Ecuador at the U.S.-Mexico border. Now, compare that to the year before 
where they encountered yeah. about 24,000. So we're talking about an increase of about five times of people that have left Ecuador looking for asylum in the U.S. This is asylum because of what's happening in Ecuador for humanitarian reasons. So you can only imagine if the violence escalates, a lot of individuals will find no other option but to leave the country and could be making their way to the U.S.-Mexico border attempting to enter the U.S. and seek asylum. Really notable numbers there, Guad. Thank you so much for bringing your reporting and your perspective to this. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Today, Alexei Navalny made his first court appearance since he was transferred to an Arctic penal colony. Here he is on a video call. Remember, he was transferred last month. It took three weeks for him to get there. Uh, he seemed to kind of be in good spirits. He was cracking jokes like whether the town he came from threw a party when he left. A judge still rejected his complaint about his treatment in prison. Out of Lithuania, the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, making a surprise visit. You see him here. He says Ukraine is trying to show that Russia can be stopped, but says they need more help in the air, basically, with the defenses there to fight Russia's missile and drone attacks. He's expected to swing by Estonia and Latvia tomorrow. And out of Spain, look at what's washing up on the shores there. Millions of plastic pellets. You're about to see people combing through the sand. They're trying to get this stuff cleaned up. How did it happen? Well, at least one container of these pellets fell off a ship off the coast of Portugal. This is plastic that's used for like water bottles, shopping bags, as you might think. It is not good for oceans and rivers and the animals who live in them. Coming up here on the show, the president's son, Hunter, set to be arraigned tomorrow on multiple felony charges in California. We're gonna take a look at how we got here in tonight's breakdown. Tomorrow, Hunter Biden is set to make another public appearance, this time in an L.A. courtroom, so he can be arraigned on nine federal tax charges, including multiple felonies. It is the latest development in the dramatic legal saga of the president's son that could see him behind bars potentially for years, all against the backdrop of congressional investigations and subpoenas, like we told you about at the top of the show, lawsuits, an impeachment inquiry for his father, all of it coming to a head in the months leading up to the 2024 election. It can be a lot to track and remember and think about. So how did we get here? How did Hunter Biden get here? That's tonight's breakdown. Hunter Biden, just three when his dad started serving in the Senate, grew up touching the world of politics and as an adult in the early 2000s, started building his resume in the lucrative fields of political consulting, lobbying and investing. He stepped away from lobbying in 2008 when his father joined Barack Obama on the presidential ticket, according to that campaign. But as the years went on, millions of dollars started rolling in to Hunter Biden and his company. In 2014, Biden joined the board of Ukrainian energy giant Burisma and the next year started a business relationship with the head of a big Chinese-owned conglomerate. Allegations would later surface from a former business partner that Biden tried to sell the illusion of access to his father. Let me state as clearly as I can my father was not financially involved in my business, not as a practicing lawyer, not as a board member of Burisma, not in my partnership with a Chinese private businessman, not in my investments at home nor abroad. 2015's also the year Bo Biden died. And I know that his hand will never leave mine. Which Hunter Biden says sent him into a relapse of his severe drug addiction. By his own account, burning through money on booze, drugs, ritzy hotels, and allegedly sex workers and luxury cars, federal prosecutors would later say, accusing Biden in an indictment of spending on everything but his taxes. I went one time for 13 days without sleeping and smoking crack and drinking vodka exclusively throughout that entire time. In 2018, two years after his father left office, the feds opened an investigation into Hunter Biden's taxes and his Chinese business dealings. That same year, Biden bought a gun from a shop in Delaware and on the paperwork, allegedly signed to a firm he was not using drugs. Fast forward to 2023 with Joe Biden in the White House now as president. And it's that gun purchase at the center of a felony charge brought against Hunter Biden, with prosecutors accusing him of lying when he pledged he was clean. Biden pled not guilty. He also faced two misdemeanors for not paying enough in taxes in 2017 and in 2018, a year in which Hunter Biden describes day bleeding into night and night into day as he smoked crack cocaine again and again. 
In late July, it looked like the legal saga would come to a fairly quiet end with a plea deal until that deal suddenly fell apart. Tonight, the dramatic turn in the criminal case against Hunter Biden as his plea deal is derailed. A month later, the attorney general appointed a special counsel who brought a set of new charges against Hunter Biden in September, alleging he was using drugs when he bought that gun. Another indictment in December included multiple felonies for failing to pay up to the IRS. That's the case being arraigned tomorrow in L.A. Two IRS workers with direct knowledge of the Hunter Biden investigation accused the Justice Department of intentionally slow walking that inquiry, which the DOJ denies. Hunter's lawyer calling the indictments political, saying if Hunter's last name was anything other than Biden, the charges in Delaware and now California would not have been brought. We will, of course, have full coverage of what happens at the arraignment tomorrow, as that is a layout of the legal landscape. But there is, of course, a political landscape, too, in Congress, as you saw just today, where those investigations into Hunter Biden are in full swing. We talked about it earlier. House Republicans moving to hold him in contempt for skipping a private deposition a few weeks ago, all connected to a bigger push to try to impeach President Biden, potentially, and connect the dots between Hunter's overseas business dealings, as Republicans are seeking to do, and his father, they have failed to prove that so far. It is something, of course, that Hunter Biden has denied. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.